Heavenly Father, we thank you very kindly for the day. We thank you for those who are gathered here. I ask you to watch over those who couldn't make it this evening. As always, we ask you to protect us as we open up your word and delve into its mysteries, its truths, and its nuggets of gold. We thank you for our, our Lord and Master who made all of this possible for, for us. Uh, we have such a grand thing to look forward to. He has given us everything we need for life and godliness. We are the recipients of all of the blessings in the heavenly realms, and every promise is yes in him. What more could people ask for? But we come in his name and in his name only. Amen. Okay, we are... Now, if you see me grab the towel and start genuflecting up here, it's because there's a fly loose. And I aim to kill a, me a messenger of Satan tonight. All right? I know. He might have been just hanging out waiting for Sunday night again. She was up here pestering me last yeah. Sunday. All right. Okay, we got halfway through chapter 43. We are on verse 15 of chapter 43, verses 15 through 34 of this chapter, or 15 to the end of the chapter. Uh, we have the, um, the brothers' second encounter with Joseph. And so in verse 15, so the men, that, uh, the men took that present and Benjamin, so the present that their father had given them was all the dainties of Canaan, um, figs and nuts and wine and who knows what else, everything but the staff of life. So they had to go to Egypt to get the wheat to make the bread, right? So the men took that present and Benjamin, and they took double money in their hand and arose and went down to Egypt, and they stood before Joseph. So now it's the brothers who have become the merchants dragging one of Rachel's sons to Egypt. Verse 16, when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, take these men to my home and slaughter an animal and make ready, for these men will dine with me at noon. High noon. You can well imagine Joseph's emotions when he singled out his little brother, Benjamin. And that these other hoodlums hadn't sold him too. I wonder if they thought, having get, received the invitation to Joseph's house, that what they were really receiving was their last meal. Uh, verse 17 and 18, Then the man did as Joseph ordered, and the, men, the man brought the men into Joseph's house. Now the men were afraid. I imagine so because they were brought into Joseph's house. And they said, it is because of the money which was returned in our sacks the first time that we are brought in so that we may, so that he may make a case against us and seize us to take us as slaves with our donkeys. So with thousands of travelers coming to buy grain from every country, why does this band of men receive such treatment if there weren't some uh, not so good purpose behind it. So verse 19, you can only imagine what was going through their minds. They've waited 22 years for the other shoe to drop, and apparently it's fixing to. So verse 19, when they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, they talked with him at the door of the house, and they tried to explain themselves to the steward. It reminds me of what Potiphar's wife did when she talked to the help and say and said, look what my husband has done to us. And so they're trying to, um, what is that? What's that word when you... I forget. I'm, 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 I'm at a loss for that word. When somebody, recruit, recruit, there you go. So she's trying to recruit an ally, or these guys are trying to rec recruit an ally with a servant. 
And verse 20 said, Oh, sir, we, in, we indeed came down for the first time to buy food, but it happened when we came to the encampment. The encampment, not home. The encampment, not home. When they came to the encampment, and we opened our sacks, and there each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, and our money in full weight. So we have brought it back in your hand. So it's not when they first found it. They didn't turn around when they first found the money. They went all the way home and stayed home and ate every other food, all the food that they brought back from Egypt. And in my mind, knowing the character of these guys, probably hoping by then the famine would lift and they would be able to grow their own food and never have to go back to Egypt and thereby get a year's worth of food for nothing. Now, I don't know if that's what was going on, but I wouldn't put anything past this outfit. All right, so... So when they said that they found it in the encampment, that's not quite the truth either. Because as we read the text carefully from the previous chapter, it wasn't until all the brothers got home that the rest of them found the silver in their sacks. So these guys are not dealing with the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help them, God. They're making junk up. Verse 22, and we have brought down other money in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. But the servant said, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Here is an Egyptian giving a Hebrew a lesson, a theology lesson on their Hebrew God. He said, peace be to you, do not be afraid. Your Elohim and the Elohim of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. So what the, what the servant is saying is, I, I, your bill was paid. I had your money. You, you, you gave me your money. Your bill was paid. So... It could be that even the servant didn't know who put the money in the sacks, or it could be he wasn't permitted to tell them who put the money in their sacks, but it wasn't what they had thought it might be. So he writes, peace, peace, shalom. He's using the word shalom. And the shalom means completeness, soundness, welfare, and peace. In verse 37, it says, The brothers could not speak shalom to Joseph. Chapter 37, verse 4. And Joseph had been sent to Shechem to see the shalom, check on the welfare, check on the shalom of your brothers. And bring me back word, so said his father. All right. Okay, so the steward's reply does not solve the mystery for them. They still don't know who has put the money back in their sacks. Then he brought Simeon out to them. Let's see. We are on verse 23, I think. Are we not? Yes. Okay, all right. <clears throat> then he brought Simeon out to them. After what could have been a year in prison, his brothers show up. And they don't show up to get Simeon out of the clanker. They show up because they're hungry. They run out of food. Now, I don't know what treatment Simeon got. I don't know whether he was sent to the king's uh, prison, probably, as a political prisoner, like the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. But either way, he's in prison, probably for a year. I wish I had been a fly on the wall for that reunion, don't you? Where have you guys been? Verse 24, so the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water. 
and they washed their feet, and he gave their donkeys food. Now, I don't know if washing your feet was an ancient Egyptian custom as it was a Jewish custom, but the Egyptians were, hmm, how shall I say this, uh, very serious about hygiene. They bathed or cleansed themselves every day. And so washing their feet would have been the normal thing to do. Verse 25, then they made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon. Um, for they heard that they would eat bread there. 26, and when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed down before him to the earth. It reminds me of when my children were growing up. And I told them, if you get in trouble... I better be the second person that finds out, you being the first, because I don't want to get a phone call and not know already that you've been up to mischief. And so (laughs) it reminds me of one day I came home and my sweet little daughter met me at the door. And that's what I get from this. They brought him the present, which was in their hand. They're waiting for him to come through the door so they can give their present and an explanation as to my little daughter met me at the door and she's was she in tears she said daddy I high odd your bulletin board I went I'm sorry honey she said I'm not even in the house I high odd your bulletin board I looked at her mom and I went (laughs) so they brought me in the house and I had a cork bulletin board with Ziggy or Iggy or Iggy, Iggy on it. And she was practicing her karate. And she karate kicked my bulletin board and broke it in half. So she wanted to be the first one to let me know that she hi-yahed, hi-yahed my bulletin board, right? Yeah. So when I read this verse, I was remind, reminded of that, and I couldn't help but chuckle. Okay. So finally, the presence of Benjamin. So the first of, and and here we have, now we have 11 brothers, right? Which is the first dream he had, right? Bowing down before him to the earth. Yeah. So he sees the first, he sees the first of his dreams come to fruition here. Verse 27, then he asked them about their well-being and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? Is he still alive? Uh, The intent of that is, is he still well? But it has been, it could have been up to a year, right? So is he still, is he still breathing? Is he still okay? I mean, what's the situation? So it might give us an idea of the time span between the first visit and the second visit. All right, verse 28, And they answered, Your servant, our father, is in good health. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves again. So this is the second time on this trip that the brothers have bowed down to Joseph, thus signifying the witness of two that a thing will be accomplished. So this is the accomplishment of his first vision. Yes. You must, you, you must, um, you, are, you are absolutely correct, but that was not a fulfillment of Joseph's first vision. Why? Because Benjamin was still at home, and only ten of his brothers bowed. Now that Benjamin is with him, we have the fulfillment of the first dream, which was eleven sheaves of wheat bowing to his. Okay? Great question, though. All right, verse 29, Then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? 
And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Now you know full well how how much children change in their younger years. They go from that fat, pudgy to, you know, our little Vivi doesn't look hardly anything like her baby pictures. Because she's sprouted and thin as they come. And... All right, and it's been 22 years since he's seen his brothers. So there, there have been some changes. Verse 30, now his heart yearned for his brother. So Joseph made haste and sought somewhere else to weep. And he went to his chamber and wept there. Whether the brothers noticed this emotion or not, we are not, we are not privy to that. They have, may, have, may have answered his question with another prostration, right? Prostrated themselves yet again. Reunions are sometimes as hard to deal with as separations. And it, you know, you know, there, there, there are, there's a very fine line, don't you think, between tears of sorrow and tears of joy. And in our case, when we are united with our Lord and King, there may be some of both. Tears of sorrow for what we may not have accomplished in our lives. And I guarantee there will be tears of joy. The judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat, where our where what we have done for Christ will be assessed. And that, judgment, that, that, that judgment is one of three that I know about relative to eschatology. And this judgment is um, exclusive. It takes place in heaven and only believers are subjected to it. So it's not a judgment of salvation. That comes later. That's the second judgment. This judgment is a judgment of not necessarily what you did, but why you did what you did. And if you are, if you and I are in ministry and we're working together and we're in the same ministry, so we produce the same results from our ministry, and we get to this judgment. It's like um, the assessor's office in San Francisco during the gold rush when a miner would come and plop a lump of ore on the assessor's table and he would assess the content of gold, which was worth something, as opposed to the content of rock, which was worth nothing. And our... our, our Offerings at this judgment are much the same way in that two miners can plop down a hundred chunk, hundred pound chunk of ore, and one guy's going to get thirteen dollars, and the other guy's going to get one hundred thirty thousand dollars. It's the same, same weight of ore, and so that first, that first judgment is if you, if you have been in ministry for the applause of men, then you have received your reward already. And what you offer at the assessor's table will go up in smoke. And there will be tears. There will be a sense of loss. There will be a sense of shame. There will be a sense of sorrow. People like the thief on the cross or those who have deathbed confessions have a right to stand there with their pockets inside out with nothing to offer. You and I do not. And I fear there will be many of us standing there with our pockets inside out. And as the text goes on, saved but as if by fire. So these pocket inside-out folks, are they saved? Yes. Are they members of the millennial kingdom? Yes. Will they live eternally? Yes. 
but they're going to come out of the assessor's office smelling like smoke. They have an excuse. We do not. I guarantee you, I absolutely guarantee you, that every, every child of God, every believer that plunks down their works for Christ, some of those are going to go up and smoke. All right? Yeah. Right? That's right. That's absolutely right. And it could be, and it could be the effort. Okay, we've been at this, what, 14 months? And it would be ridiculous of me to tell you that every time I'm up here, my motives are totally pure, and every presentation is going to be gold, silver, and precious stones. But some of them weren't. I'm, I'm human, right? Some of them were, I'm here because I have to be here. I'm here because you all are here. I don't want to let you down. And although that's, that's fine, um, it, may not, it may not suffer the judgment. So be prepared. I think we're all going to be crying at the assessor's table, crying tears of sorrow and crying tears of joy. All right. Yes. Question. Great, great question. What's the difference between somebody who has uh, deeds that survive the fire of judgment and come out as gold, silver, and precious stones? I will tell you that I am, I am working for all the gold and silver and precious gems I can amass. I want as much of that as I can get. And not because I'll be able to carry it around in the kingdom going, then, 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 then. But because I will have something to lay at the feet of my king by way of gratitude for what he has done for me. That's why. Does that answer your question, Denon? Yes, sir. It, it, it is and it isn't because here's the deal. Here's the deal. God bought you out of the slave market of sin into the slave market of righteousness. He did that. He did that because he already had, Ephesians 2.10, already had a list of things he wanted Patty to do after he bought her. 1 Corinthians 6, your life is not your own. You were bought with a price. So after he bought you out of the slave market of sin, he did that because he had things he wanted you to do. Okay? Now, as a servant, as a slave, my job is to keep my ear tuned to hear the voice of the master. And when I hear that, my response my expected response, my only response that won't get me looked at is here I am. And then we are to go. And we see this in the lives of the patriarch early the next morning. They didn't mess around. They didn't wait. They didn't make sure that it was God talking to them. They didn't give themselves time to come up with excuses or reasons why they shouldn't. They went. Tracking so far? Okay. So now, as, as, as the servant of God, you have been called, and you have answered that call, and he has told you what he wants you to do. Then he empowers you to do it and rewards you for getting it done. Pretty awesome, huh? Yeah, what a deal. So, can those be hard? Absolutely, absolutely. But what we, what we more often have to get over in order to be obedient 
is ourselves. Our pride. Right? Well, that's out of my comfort zone. Well, I imagine the cross was out of Christ's comfort zone too. Yeah? Yeah, it's uncomfortable. I get it. I, I, I appreciate that. Great question. Will those rewards have anything to do with how we serve in the millennial kingdom? Is that, is that Am I right? Okay. So <clears throat> we had this discussion in one of the groups I meet with. Uh, they wanted to know, are there levels of heaven? And I said, I don't know about levels of heaven, but I certainly think there's a hierarchy in heaven. And part of that we see in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, where it talks about the armor of God. And it says, we do not fight against flesh and blood, but we, we fight against powers and principalities and sp the spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenly realm. Okay? Those are all not the same thing. Lucifer was entitled the, not a, the anointed cherub. He's one of three angels we know by name. Lucifer, Gabriel, and Michael. Hence the third of the angels, right? Jesus Christ, when he was talking to his the religious right in hmm, Capernaum, I think it was. He said, it will be better for Sodom and Gomorrah than it will be for you. Which to me would indicate that there are also levels or, or um, hierarchies in hell. There are those who die in ignorance, and there are those who die with the full knowledge of the scriptures. And they will all share the same place. But do, but do you think, and, and I am, I am, this is just me, okay? This is just me. If you ask me for chapter and verse, I can't give it to you. But using the full counsel of scripture, do you know that the lake of fire was not designed for unbelievers? It was not built for unbelievers. It was built for the devil, the false prophet, and the Antichrist. That's who it was intended for. And I can't believe, I, let me, before, before I get to that, I don't believe there's going to be a party there. You're going to go to hell. Well, I'll be with friends. I don't think so. Having read many books about the Vietnam War, I understand the efficacy of keeping the prisoners isolated. It will drive them mad. That's what solitary confinement is for. So as I believe... When Jesus said, don't fear, don't be afraid, for in my Father's house are many dwelling places. Are we all going to live in one great big giant room? I don't think so. So I don't think hell is going to be like that either. I don't think the lake of fire is going to be like that either. I can't imagine the cell that Satan is thrown into for a thousand years to be the same as everybody else's cell. I think it may be special. There was designed for him, and there's one for the false prophet, and there's one for the Antichrist. Now, this is just me, okay? But do I think there will be different responsibilities in heaven or in the millennial kingdom as we rule and reign? I absolutely do. And why do I think that? Because the pattern in the Gospels, the pattern out of Jesus' mouth, five talent servants, two talent servants, one talent servants, right? He who is faithful over little will be made responsible over much, right? So that, yeah, I do believe. I do believe there will be different responsibilities in heaven. And people like the thief on the cross and 
and deathbed confessors, they may be sweeping the streets of gold and be just delighted to be there, as you and I will be. Because what it all boils down to is what Alistair McLean makes very, a very poignant part about. When Alistair Begg, thank you. What did I say? McLean? Yeah. No, that's MASH. That's a different story. So Alistair Begg, have you seen the video? Where the thief on the, he, he wants to talk to the thief on the cross. He hopes he runs into that guy in heaven. And he gets a chance to talk to him. And he's going to ask him, so how, how'd that all work out for you? I mean, you've never been in a Bible study. You don't know anything about church membership. But you made it. How'd you make it? And the thief on the cross is going to say, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I mean, I don't know. Well, that flummoxes the angel, and he says, hey, Hang on, let me get my supervisor. So the supervisor angel shows up and he says, okay, now we just have a couple of questions. Are you clear on the sufficiency of the doctrine of, of, the doctrine of scripture? And the thief is going to go, I had never heard of it. I never heard, I never heard of that. Well, are, are, you, are you clear on the theology of justification? And the thief is just going to stare at this, this guy like he's speaking a foreign language. And in frustration, the supervisor angel is going to ask this question. Then by what authority are you here? And the thief's on the cross's answer is the same answer that you and I have. Because the man on the middle cross said I could come. That's it. And as Alistair goes on to say, if we, if we are asked that question and we answer in the first person, we have missed the boat because I did this, because I attended church, because I read the Bible. No. You have to answer it in the third person because he, because he, because of what he did, right? So that's... I don't know if it's a bonus or not, but I hope I answered. Did I answer your question in all of that? Yeah, I think that's what's tied to the rewards. That and the that and the fact that through the rewards we have an opportunity to express our gratitude to the Savior. This is how grateful I am for what you did, and here they are. And after 40 years, if we've got nothing to go, here you are. That kind, of, that kind of expresses our level of gratitude, don't you think? And there are a lot of reasons for that, but we won't go into them. All right? Okay. So, yeah, I believe that there is a hierarchy in the millennial kingdom. Okay, uh, we should probably move on unless there's another question. Okay, all right. Uh, verse 31, then Jacob, Joseph, washed his face and came out, and he restrained himself and said, serve the bread. So this is a marvelous, wonderful picture of something is yet to be fulfilled. The prophet Zechariah in 13.6 tells us that Jesus Christ is going to make himself known unto his brethren someday. They're going to ask him about the piercing of his side and the nail prints in his hands. He's going to say to them on that day, these I received in the house of my friends. And they will recognize him and they will weep. He is the one who has provided salvation for them. He is the one who gave his life for their redemption. This is going to take place when the Lord Jesus comes back to earth. That happens, by the way, in Revelation chapter 19. The rapture is not the second coming of Christ. It's termed the uh, blessed hope as opposed to the glorious appearing. So the blessed hope is a reference to the rapture where God will call and we will meet him in the air. 
He does not come to earth until chapter 17, 19 of Revelation, and that is the glorious appearing. He is the one who gave his life for their redemption. This is going to take place when the Lord Jesus comes back to the earth. He will be revealed to his brethren, the nation Israel. There will be a remnant there who will know him. Many of his brethren did not believe on him when he came the first time. But I assure you, they will know him when he comes the second time. And in fact, one of the qualifications, one of the things that will take place, that will take place, it's not a personal, but a national confession from Israel that Jesus is the Messiah. Okay? All right. Verse 32. They served him by himself, the brothers by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with them by themselves, because Egyptians could not eat with Hebrews, for that is detestable to Egyptians. So there are basically three tables here. And the significance might be an indication of the sufficiency of the giver of bread, because three is a complete number. Practically speaking, Joseph was separated by himself because as far as his brothers were concerned, he was an Egyptian. As far as the Egyptians were concerned, he was a Hebrew. And to the brothers, they, this may have served, it may have served as yet another clue to his nationality, but their eyes had not been sufficiently awakened. They're still worried about themselves. And relative to the rest of them, it may have been his office that separated him as well. Verse 33, the men had been seated before him in the order of their ages from the firstborn to the youngest, and they looked at each other in astonishment. What else does this guy know about us that we don't know he knows about us? Verse 34, when portions were served to them from jo Joseph's table, Benjamin's portion was five times as much as anyone else's. <clears throat> so they feasted and drank freely with him. These are tests that Joseph is putting his brothers through. With him, it was a special coat. Now it's five times more food than you have. And five is a very interesting number in the scripture. So they feasted and drank freely with him, meaning there did not appear to be any animosity toward Benjamin as there had been toward Joseph. So maybe over the span of 22 years, these brothers have learned some things. Maybe. We will read on. Any questions on chapter 43? Chapter 44. Oh, by the way, before we go any further, um, the guys that do the recording here have made the video searchable on YouTube, so you don't need that special link anymore. All right. Okay, verse four, chapter 44. Now Joseph continues to test his brothers relative to their relationship with his little brother. And the tests he uses here would give him absolute proof that his brothers would not repeat the episode with Benjamin that they did with himself. So he doesn't feel like he can make himself known to his brothers until he has tested their heart. Now, is that ringing any bells for you? Yeah. Had Joseph revealed who he was at an earlier date, his brothers would have thought they were being dealt with out of a motive of vengeance, possibly, rather than one of um, purity. Verse 1, and he commanded the steward of his house, saying, fill the, men's <laughs> fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Also, <clears throat> this gets into controversy here. 
and hopefully I will be able to uh, dispel that somewhat for you. I also put my silver cup, this my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest and his grain money. So he did according to word that Joseph had spoken. I want you to be very sure you've read here that it was not Joseph who said he uses this cup for divination. All right? Put my favorite silver cup in the bag of the youngest one. And unless the brothers had dined with Joseph in his house at his table, there would not have been an opportunity for them to steal his silver cup. <coughs> Excuse me. This was a test. Will the brothers abandon Benjamin as they had Joseph? Because the circumstances are going to be a little different here than they were the first time these guys are getting out of Egypt, headed to Canaan with donkeys loaded with grain. Verse 3, as soon as the morning dawned, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. When they had gone out of the city and were not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, Get up, follow the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is not this the one from which my Lord drinks? and with which he indeed practices divination. You have done evil in so doing. Who described the cup as the one Joseph used for divination? The servant. Okay? How else could this guy possibly know the things that he knows? Okay. We'll get into more of that in a little, a little later. So the Hebrew has a play on words here, and it literally, literally reads, divining, he divines. The root of the word to divine is the same root as the word for serpent, because occultism is connected with Satan. Earlier, this object was simply referred to as a silver cup, probably the same one that Joseph used while he was having lunch with his brother. So they've seen him drink out of it. They know it belongs to him. Egyptian... Magicians did use divining cups, and the procedure for divining went something like this. Clean water was poured into such a cup or a bowl. Particles of gold or silver or precious stones were dropped into the clean water, and then some oil was added. Then, depending on exactly how light broke out between the oil and the particles, a prediction would be made. This practice is known by a variety of names. Olomancy, meaning pour, pouring oil into the water. Hydromancy, or pouring water into the oil. Or lacunamancy, observing the actions of liquids inside a cup. All right, reading the tea leaves, stirring the tea, reading the tea leaves kind of thing. Okay. It's obvious the brothers knew what the vessel stood for and what the consequences would be for anyone who would try to steal such a thing. Kind of like it reminded me of Rachel stealing Laban's idols. Right? Yeah. This is nothing more than part and parcel of the ruse that Joseph is perpetrating on his brothers. They will no doubt know when confronted the importance that is placed on this vessel, the eagerness with which Joseph wants it back, and the severe penalty for its theft in the first place. Now, don't you imagine for one second that the servant is in the encampment of these 11 hoodlums, or 10 at least, alone. He has probably brought a contingent of the Egyptian army with him. So they are fully prepared to drag these boys back by force if that is needed. We know that Joseph had a gift. All of Egypt knows that Joseph had a gift. Pharaoh know, knew that Joseph had a gift. He was a prophetor, prophet and an interpreter of dreams. This gift, however, was not in the cup, was it? No. It was a gift from God. 
for the fulfillment of his purpose. And what is his purpose? Genesis 50, verse 20. When Joseph looks at his brothers and said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Okay? Romans 8, 28 for you and I. Verse 6, so he overtook them and he spoke to, the, to them these same words. And they said to him, why does my Lord say these words? Far be it from us that your servants should do. Far be it. Far be it for us to do such a thing. Look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? Hmm. What was at stake here was much more than a single silver cup. To the superstitious, it may have represented the power of God. As Israel was guilty of many times in their history, when they sent the ark out first, like the pagans did with their idols. Sometimes that was appropriate when God said it was, and every other time it was not appropriate. To enhance the ruse, they may have seen Joseph staring into the liquid in this cup, during lunch. Some of this is just me. Got it? All right. Verse 9. With whomever of your servants, these guys are talking boldly, making covenants, making promises, without having any facts whatsoever. And they say, with whomever of your servants it is found, let him die. And we also will be my Lord's slaves. Well, guess what? You can, be, you can be Joseph's slaves without your permission. One of many rash oaths presented to us in Scripture that didn't go so well. How about the old boy who promised whoever, whoever comes out of my house, right, wound up being his daughter? Yikes. Verse 10, and he said, now also let it be according to your words. The servant says, okay, all right, I accept, I accept your deal. He with whom it is found shall be my slave, and you shall be blameless. So he obviously understands that Joseph's intent was to frame Benjamin. Maybe not why, but Joseph told his servant, put my cup into the sack of the youngest. <clears throat> The man is only obeying orders here, as is proper. He knows exactly where to look, since he hid the goblet himself in Benjamin's bag, but in order to hide the fa that fact, he goes through the motions of an elaborate search, starting with the oldest one, working his way down to the youngest one. So here's the servant. Boys are probably surrounded by armed Egyptian soldiers. And he searches Reuben's sack. And everybody's holding their breath. And he doesn't find the cup in Reuben's sack. And there is a collective sigh of relief. Then they go to Simeon. Then they go to Levi. Then they go to Judah. And he works his way all the way down to Benjamin. And by the time they get to Benjamin, I would imagine these guys are feeling pretty confident. And then, oh my goodness, what does the servant find in Benjamin's bag? The silver cup that he puts in. <laughs> Verse 11, then each man speedily let down his sack to the ground and each opened his sack. So he searched. He began with the oldest and left off with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Verse 13, Then they tore their clothes, and each man loaded his donkey and returned to the city. Tearing of the clothes is a classic gesture of extreme distress. Verse 14, So Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, 
and he was still there. And they fell before him on the ground. Here we are the third time. These boys have prostrated themselves before their younger brother. Joseph is still in the house. He doesn't have to be summoned. He knows what's coming. How does he know what's coming if we have stolen his cup with which he divines? Must not need the cup. Judah alone is mentioned here for two reasons that I know of. He'll be the one to intercede on Benjamin's behalf as he is the one with whom, who has the most skin in the game. It indicates that he is already rising to prominence in the clan. Verse 15, And Joseph said to them, What deed is this you have done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly practice divination? He's playing into the ruse. This was said to heighten the tension and the dread of his brothers. Joseph does not practice divination any more than Benjamin stole the cup. However, Joseph is reading omens. Omens are what? Signs, right? So he's reading, he's reading signs here. Signs based on the behavior of his, of his brothers to determine whether they're changed men. Indeed, he's using the cup for divination, but not as far as hydromancy goes. He's using it to read the responses of his brothers to find out whether or not they're going to abandon Benjamin or if they've really changed. Verse 16, Then Judah said, What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the, the iniquity of your servants. Here we are, my Lord's slaves, both we and he also with whom the cup was found. So Judah, Judah recognized they had no defense. <clears throat> that is our position too, based on the 14 count indictment that the Apostle Paul writes against us in the first three chapters of Romans. We have no defense. We have no exhibit A. We have nothing to present to the judge. And Judah admits guilt, not about stealing the cup, but by selling Joseph, of which Judah was the instigator. Judah is the Hebrew. Judas is the Greek. Both of them instigated the sale of the Savior. Okay. And his brothers know how he suffered. They know how Joseph cried from the bottom of that pit. And Judas surrenders, as you and I do. At the bar of God's judgment, we have no defense. So we have been called before the bar of judgment. The case has been made against us. We have no defense. The verdict is in. What is the verdict? Guilty. What is the penalty? Death. Death meaning both physical death and spiritual death. The only caveat that God offers, the Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 18, says every soul that sins must die. The wages of sin is death. And all have fallen short. <clears throat> Romans 3.11 says, No man seeks after God. No not even you religious people. Speak into the Pharisees. The only caveat to this, in order for God to be just, somebody has to do the time for the crime. And the only caveat he allows is somebody else doing the time 
for your crime and mine. And that, of course, is his son. But God does not let us go except judgment has been rendered unless somebody pays the penalty, pays the cost. No, God is not fair. There is no claim in Scripture that God is fair. It is only that he is just. In order to maintain his holiness, he has to maintain his justice. His holiness demands his justice. There are two things listed in the Psalms that God swears by. One is his holiness and one is his wrath. Ephesians chapter 4 says prior to our coming to Jesus, we were objects of God's wrath. That is often, I don't, and I'm not sure if there's an exception to this. The Apostle Paul starts his many epistles with what word? Grace. And what's the next word? Peace. There is no peace with God except there is grace first. Verse 17. But he said, Far be it for me that I should do so. The man in whose hand the cup was found, he shall be my slave. As for you, go up in peace to your father. Hoy, there's the test. So he rejects Judah's offer, and Benjamin alone was to suffer punishment. And this winds up being the final test. And this is actually the pivotal point of this section of Joseph's narrative. The suspense has been building to this point since the brothers first encountered Joseph in chapter 42 and bowed before him. This is the pinnacle of that suspense. It doesn't get more tense than it is right now. Verse 18, Then Judah came near to him and said, O oh my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing. Do you know how, do you, do you know how risky you know how risky that move is? We read in the book of X, Esther that to approach King Artaxerxes without first having been invited is a death sentence. And she did that. What did Mordecai say? Maybe you were made queen for just a time as this. And she approached King Artaxerxes without having been in, invited, and he lifted his scepter, right? Accepting her approach and sparing her from the death penalty. Here is Judah approaching what, in his mind, is his king, his lord. Certainly lord of Egypt. And Judah came near to him and said, Oh, my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing. And do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. You have the power of life and death at a word. Verse 19, My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or brother? And we said to my Lord, we have a father, an old man and a child of his old age who is young. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. See, he's, he's reading from the court reporter here, right? <clears throat> Verse 22, and he said to my Lord, the lad cannot leave his father. Or if he should leave his father, his father would die. That's how wrapped up Jacob is in the life of Benjamin. But you said to your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down 
with you, you shall see my face no more. So your little brother is the ticket into the magic kingdom. And so it was when we went up to your servant, my father, that he told, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go back and buy us a little food. But we said, we cannot go down. If your youngest brother is not with us, if our youngest brother is not with us, then we will go down, for we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. And your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons, and the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn to pieces. This may be the first time Joseph is made aware of the subterfuge used on his dead. Surely he is torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. But if you take this one also from me, and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Now here's the full confession. Jacob had been deceived, and Joseph could see that now. He now knows exactly what his brothers told his father. It happened so long ago. Did they lie to dad? No. Did they lead him to believe a lie? Yes. Does that qualify as a truth? No. Verse 30, Now therefore when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us that he will die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave, and it will be your fault. Don't you see that here? It's the woman you gave me kind of thing going on here. Yeah, we did it, but if you don't let Benjamin go, then you're responsible for our father's death. We sure didn't see this kind of plea when it was Simeon that was left behind, did we? <laughs> oh, yeah. I wonder how he's taking it listening to this. Hey, wait a minute. But he realizes how severe the hunger in Canaan must be for his father to be forced into this decision. Tough. Difficult situations require tough, difficult decisions. Almost always not pleasant, right? Certainly never easy. Hence the word difficult. Yes, Judah did this because he had sworn to his dad on the life of his boys. Right? Yeah, I think that's what it was. So Judah has the most skin in the game here. Not to mention the fact that God has orchestrated this and put Judah in the forefront. Right? Yeah. No, he's not. He's not the oldest. No, Judah is the fourth born son. Now, later on we'll find out when Jacob blesses his boys, that Reuben, Simeon, and Levi lose their place as firstborn and do not receive the birthright nor the blessing. Okay, verse 32. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, please let your servant, he's talking about himself, Remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord and let the lad go with his brothers. That's a, that's a long way to come because it was Judah who suggested that Joseph be sold into slavery. Now he's willing to become a slave as a substitute for Benjamin. So that's a change. That's a change. Yes, he has his own sons on the line, but still, that is a change. 
Verse 34, for how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me, lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father. <clears throat> we didn't see that evil with Joseph, did we? We didn't have that opinion with Joseph, did we? No. We sat and commiserated with our father after watching his response to our subterfuge. So Judah's speech reveals in important information that is critical to Joseph's test. It becomes clear that the brothers have a new sensitivity to their father's feelings. They earlier thought little of how their father would feel when they sold Joseph. They have now lived for 22 years in the shadow of his grief, and it has changed them. Okay, that's chapter 44, I think. Yep. Any questions? We'll begin next week with 45. I def I, we will definitely finish this before the end of August, or by the end of Aug uh, October. Thank you. Yeah. August. Wow, that's another year away. Wow. We're going to really cover these last chapters in detail. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Oh. Okay. So an excellent book, and you can get it for free in PDF form, is Numbers in Scripture by E. W. Bullinger. Okay. Number five. Okay. Now, he's not, he doesn't begin his explanations this way because he thinks we're stupid. This is just what he does. Five. You with me, Patty? Is four plus one. All right. Yeah, because we've already he's already explained the significance of one and the significance of four. Okay. We have had here hitherto the three persons of the Godhead and their manifestation in creation. So number one is the Father, number two is the Son, number three is the Spirit, number four is creation. Now we have a further revelation of a people called out from mankind, redeemed and saved to walk with God from earth to heaven. Hence, redemption follows creation. Inasmuch as, is, inasmuch as in consequence of the fall of man, creation came under the curse and was made subject to vanity. We talked about that this morning, didn't we, William? Therefore, man in creation must be redeemed. All right? So with the fall of man, man was not the only thing that was affected by the fall. It was not the only, he was not the only thing put under the curse of the fall. The Apostle Paul says all nature groans under the curse. So five is, five is redemption. Then he gives you examples. All right? There are five great mysteries, and five is therefore the number of grace. If four is the number of the world, and it represents man's weakness and helplessness and vanity, as we have seen. But four plus one equals five, again, just in case, you know, you forgot. That is significance, significant of divine strength added to and made, and made perfect in that weakness. Of omnipotence combined with the impotence of earth, of divine favor, uninfluenced and invincible. The word earth is, in Hebrew, and he tells you, the gametria. Okay. All right. The gametria of grace is 725. You know what gametria is? Okay. So, <clears throat> having grown up in the IT world, Right, William? We can count in binary. We can count in octal. We can count in decimal. We can count in hexadecimal. Right? Yeah. And 
the reason we can do that is that all of those um, numeric systems start with zero and go upward, right? Okay. And all of those numbers are weighted. So zero is zero. The next position is one. The next position is two. The next position is four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, and off we go. All right? So <clears throat> Hebrew is a weighted language, and Greek is a weighted language in that the position of their letters, wherever that position is, carries a numeric value. There's a numeric value associated with each letter of the Greek and or Hebrew alphabet. And so what the scribes would do when they were copying a uh, scroll is they would write a checksum. There would be a checksum on the, on the original. They would write their copy. Then they would add the weighted values of all those letters and write a checksum. And if this checksum on the copy was different than this checksum on the original, they would destroy the copy and start again. All right? So that's how, that's what gametria is, is the numerical value based on the weight of the letters. Roman numerals, right? I is 1. What is V? 5. What's X? 10. We know that, right? Okay. Do you know what the gametria of the Roman numerals as we as we know them equals? 666. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so that's that's how you get to numbers. E.W. Bullinger. It's a fairly he's fairly easy to read, right? Four plus one is five, Patty. Right? There are more in-depth books on numerology <clears throat> than his, but his is easy to read. And I will caution you not to get wrapped around the axle of numerology. Okay? Is six an important number? Yes. What is six? Man's number. Why? Because it's not complete. What is complete? Seven. There's seven days in a week, right? What's another complete number? Twelve. Twelve signs of the zodiac. Twelve tribes of Israel. Twelve, twelve apostles. Right? Yeah. So these are all these all these are all numbers of significance. But don't let them get you wrapped around the axle. Don't make that the point. Jesus Christ is always the point. Okay, Mike, would you mind praying us out of here, please? Father, for this uh, time we gather together, thank you for the uh, knowledge, the understanding, this book that you have given us to mm. share it out, to better understand, to gain a closer knowledge to you. Uh, we spend this time uh, to gain that love and knowledge, to be close to you, not just the head knowledge, but that we can use it uh, as we live our lives. And I pray that you will bear this. Uh, Amen. Thank you.